Hello, warm welcome to this talk. Now, I want to look at repurposed drugs for cancer today. This is a remarkably important topic that's simply not being covered in any mainstream outlets or significantly covered at all, really. Why is it important? Because we've had problems with cancer, of course, for hundreds of years, certainly for the last decades. In, in my working experience, we've seen huge amounts of cancer. Secondly, because cancer does seem to be increasing, especially in the younger demographic. Um, thirdly, because healthcare provision is not always what we'd like it to be. And some parts of the world, people simply can't afford expensive, sophisticated healthcare provision, such as radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So lots of reasons why we need to do more for cancer than we're doing now. Now, I want to look at a couple of papers today, but I want to start off with this one here. This is from the International Journal of Molecular Science. Repositioning of uh, anthelmitic drugs, more on that in a minute, for the treatment of cancers of the digestive system. Now, this paper does take uh, digestive system cancers particularly, but we'll be talking about other ones as, as we go as well. Now, that's this paper here talks about tumours of the digestive system, which are really remarkably common, but their incidence continues to increase. And sadly, we've been talking to cancer specialists who are seeing an increase in younger demographics of late as well. Um, the process of discovering, validating novel and effective drugs against these, malig the, these malignancies is lengthy and costly, and very often they're not very effective, and very often they are phenomenally uh, expensive as well so we could do with alternatives so drug repositioning or drug repurposing is finding new uses for approved drugs so these are drugs which are approved already sometimes approved for human uses other times approved for veterinary uses now veterinary use is being used as a as a disparaging term horse paste comes to mind but of course the drug that we're talking about there ivermectin we don't want to use pace, of course. We want to use drug that if you're going to take a drug orally, it's got to be one that's designed for oral use. But the point is the ivermectin that you give to horses and the ivermectin you give to humans is the same molecule. You know, when your dog gets sick, you give them amoxicillin. That's exactly the same as you would take if it's a, a particular type of infection. The vets know which ones to give for which infections. But they're the same antibiotics as we use in humans. We are all mammals. The drugs work in very similar ways. Not always the same, of course. But the drugs are molecules. And, and whether it's uh, for a drug that's used for veterinary purposes or human purposes, um, it's actually the same molecule. Now, of course, we can only take drugs that are approved and, and don't take any drugs at all based on what I say. This is entirely for educational purposes. But I don't like the way drugs have been disparaged as if, the, as if animals have some sort of substandard uh, set of molecules that they're given whereas human drugs are somehow better molecules no a drug is a drug it's a molecule amoxicillin is amoxicillin ivermectin is ivermectin it's a molecule they're, they're the same anyway having got that point out of the way <laughs> sometimes these drugs are approved for animals sometimes for humans uh, provides the opportunity to expedite promising anti-cancer agents into clinical trials now this is another problem here clinical trials so I'm going to show you later on about people who might want to take drugs that haven't been through clinical trials. Not that we're advocating that, but some people might want to do that. Now, clinical trials have their limitations. And the idea that everything has got to be a randomised, double-blind, controlled clinical trial is, is actually... It, it, most of the treatments that we use are not based on this level of evidence. And these trials aren't always well conducted. And the trials that are conducted are sometimes idiosyncratically selected. So the idea that this is somehow some gold standard. Yeah, OK, it is a gold standard, but it's not the only standard. There are other ways of collecting evidence through mass participation, for example. I'll show you what I mean when we give a specific example shortly. Anyway, now th these drugs are uh, ant, ant helm Mintix, anthelmintix. Now you do see anti-helmintix as well, and you do see different spellings. Uh, 
The reason I'm using this is because that's the one that's on this particular paper. Now, the helminths are worms. And these worms uh, infect uh, the gastrointestinal tract primarily. Round worms and tapeworms. The, 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 so the helminths are these worms. And these uh, anthelmintic drugs are drugs used to combat those. But it turns out they've got a wide variety of mechanisms of action as well. Some of which have got very promising anti-cancer properties. Uh, some of these medicines, according to this paper, showed uh, anti-tumour activities. And again, you can spell tumour with a U. We put a U in there t uh, uh, in the UK. Uh, that's the spelling that's in this paper. So that's the one I've kept. Um, and these drugs have shown ability to target key oncogenic signals, transduction pathways. Now, a transdu transduction pathway is just a way that a message goes basically through, normally through a cell. Uh, but th in this case, it's oncogenic, one which will start cancer. But if these can be disrupted, the cancer won't start. First group here we want to talk about, uh, be be ben never mind that, be benzimidiazoles. The, th the key thing is the endinazoles. <laughs> Some have been uh, successfully tested for the treatment of gastrointestinal liver and pancreatic cancers from this paper. So mebendazole is the first one. Now, I've been using mebendazole for years and years and years for treating worms very common uh very safe personally i've never come across any adverse reactions to it i've taken it myself on several occasions when i've been exposed to wormy type uh, infections working in the tropics and less hygienic parts of the world very common uh, now this blocks tubulin polymerization now, i'm not going to go into all these mechanisms but basically in, inside a cell that you probably know you have cells and you have a the outer cell membrane and you have the nucleus now in the cells there's lots and lots of microtubules that give the cell structure you often don't see these under a microscope microscopic tubules that give the cell structure and th th that's so and these are made of uh, tubulin this is the protein they're made of and if you stop these preliminarizing if you stop them s sticking together into long columns then you can't make these microtubules so you can't make you can't make the cells you can't make the cancer cells which of course is brilliant uh, seem to inhibit cell growth uh, and uh, invasion of ascites cell lines derived from primary gastric tumours. So in other words, these are malignant cells taken from the fluid in people's abdomens, but that originate from gastric tumours. It works against those. Whether used alone or in combination with chemotherapeutics. Now, this is the advantage of these drugs. Many of these drugs, these anthelminthic drugs, um, because they're very safe, Okay, no drugs completely safe, but because they tend to be safe, um, you can use them on their own at reasonably high doses sometimes, or um, you can use them in combination with existing protocols. You can use it as well as. Um, so it's not saying you should try this as opposed to conventional therapy. Uh, you know, why, why not? Why not try both together? Would be the way of thinking. What we really need is to get all these drugs looked at and get the oncologists to work out and the pharmacologists working out which ones are uh, the best ones. These are all the ones looked at in this paper. I mean, it's a huge, uh, huge variety looked at in this paper. All these different drugs. These are all anti-parasitic or uh, anti-helminthic drugs. Uh, you might have come across that one, for example. Um, th these are all drugs of this uh, category and we really need to find out just what they do and which ones are particularly good at what but many of them do seem to have a remarkably broad um, um, a broad spectrum of action because they have a very, very wide variety of pharmacodynamic effects weight weight apparent ways of working uh, treatment was also successful in colorectal cell cancer lines. And this is interesting. Showed no cytotoxic activity. In other words, did not kill cells against three cell lines with non-malignant phenotypes. In other words, normal cells. So we seem to have compounds here which are killing cancer cells while having no activity against normal cells. Sounds too good to be true, really. But this is what this research is is certainly intimating towards. 
um, induce emission of lung and lymph node metastases. So when when the cancers had spread to the lung and the uh, lymph nodes, uh, they were still still effective. So when the cancer is spread, um, you can't cut it out surgically because it's everywhere. You need a systemic approach, and they these seem to offer that possibility, and also. Uh, some efficacy in patients with refractory metastatic colon cancer. Refractory means it doesn't respond to treatment. Metastatic means it's already spread, started in the colon. Anti-cancer properties in the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma, that is uh, liver cancer. Now, um, here's another paper here. Um, emergent uh, perspectives on the antiparasitic mebendazole as a repurposed drug for the treatment of brain cancer. So here we see a possibility that mebendazole might also be useful for brain cancers. Again, these things really need looked at in, in, in detail. Um, so brain. So in other words, I'm just putting that in to show it's not just gastrointestinal cancers, it's just this paper's talking about it. Abendazole, see again, it ends in azole. Uh, cytostatic, so in other words, the cells didn't carry on dividing, effects on human cancer cell lines, potential anti-cancer agent also for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma, that's the liver cancer, some efficacy against pancreatic cell lines, positive mice studies, some early human studies as well. So clearly what we need is more human studies. Now ivermectin, this paper does talk about ivermectin, uh, it talks about it in terms of colorectal cancer and gastric cancer and in vitro and in vivo. So there is some evidence that it's working effectively uh, in the living situation. And ivermectin really is a promising drug which needs to be analysed uh, more for this and basically needs to be tried uh, by people that need it in, in a controlled situation. Uh, ivermectin, a potential anti-cancer drug derived from an antiparasitic drug, is this paper here. Now, we have looked at this before. That's this paper here. Work done surprisingly mostly in China. Um, maybe they have less uh, external influences on what they can study and what they can't study. Um, ivermectin induced different program cell deaths. For example, that one was called apoptosis. Now, this has found potential efficacy or efficacy in breast cancer, digestive system cancer. This is all ivermectin. Gastric cancer, hepatocellular cancer, urinary system cancer, renal cell cancer, prostate cancer, hematological cancer, leukemia. Basically everything. Reproductive system, cervical, ovarian, brain glioma, glioblastoma, which is a very malignant brain tumour. Uh, respiratory system cancer, nasopharyngeal uh, carcinoma, lung cancer, and, and melanoma. Now, this does sound like it's an awful lot, but there does seem to be a lot of different mechanisms of action that these drugs, uh, in the case of ivermectin, of course, derive from natural bacterial uh, products. Now, just to be clear, I'm not advocating taking any drugs. I don't prescribe drugs. This is way beyond what I can do. Um, this is just purely an educational discussion video, but it is based on on uh, peer-reviewed literature. Therefore, needs to be taken seriously. Is humanity really missing a trick here? Yes, I think it is. Now, under the last time Donald Trump was president... We had he had this thing. I don't know. I don't know what the legal status of this turned out to be. I don't think it was carried on. But President Donald J. Trump to sign right to try legislation for fulfill, fulfilling the promise he made to expand healthcare opportunities for uh, terminal Americans. So if people are dying anyway, people who are terminally ill should not have to go from country to country to seek a cure. I want to give them a chance right here at home. So what this paper is saying. And I would hope this is going to be resurrected under the new Trump administration. What this is saying is that if someone's dying and they want to try a particular treatment, then why the heck shouldn't they be allowed to? Why should we be in a situation where someone who's dying wants to try 
ivermectin for their cancer, say. What on earth gives the state the power to say, no, you can't try that? I feel that legislation around the world should be changed to this. To give people the opportunity to try what the heck they want. You know, if someone's dying and they think, you know, I, I just think I, I quite fancy a large glass of uh, single malt whiskey from the Isle of Lewis, then flip and let them have it. Let them try whatever they want. And that goes for drugs that could potentially alleviate their condition. Potentially. Why not try it? And as people choose to try these drugs, we can build up huge amounts of evidence prospectively. So someone with a terminal condition may say, well, you know, I've got advanced prostate cancer. I would like to try taking ivermectin alongside my traditional treatments. Or some people might say, well, my traditional treatments have failed. I've now got metastatic prostate cancer. I'd like to try ivermectin on its own or ivermectin with fenbendazole or some other drug. And then that data can be prospectively collected. And the people that chose not to have that drug, they would be the control group. And would end up with, by collecting huge amounts of data in very small amounts of time. Rather than running phenomenally expensive, often biased, randomised controlled trials. Why, why don't we do that? We could collect a million pieces of data from combinations of countries in no time at all then we would know and the potential for treatments for cancer at essentially zero cost who would be available now i'm just going to close with um another quick message from uh dr kathleen uh ruddy now we did uh, look at a video clip from uh, dr ruddy just recently and um she talked about a patient, patient with uh, basically terminal metastatic prostate cancer who basically dramatically improved, essentially was cured, uh, taking ivermectin. Let, let's uh, listen to another account from her now and then we'll close. For now, thank you for watching. A second patient crossed my path. A guy in his 70s who had been losing weight for a year and a half, 40 pounds, not vaccinated, 40 pound weight loss, smoker, drinker, all he does is fish. And um, he could no longer swallow and he could hardly talk. <laughs> and so I got on the phone with him and uh, I said, uh, Eddie, you know, tell me a little bit about your history and so forth. He knew someone with prostate cancer who had taken ivermectin, had cured himself from prostate cancer with that. So Eddie began taking ivermectin. I have no idea what the dosing was. He was just taking it. And uh, I gave him some advice about diet and you know, try and get the weight back on and so on and so forth. Within a couple of weeks, he sounded stronger. Mm -hmm. he sounded stronger. He could swallow. He had gained six pounds. His, his voice was better. Followed him for the next couple of weeks, maybe another month or so, and I said, Eddie, we need to get a scan. He doesn't have insurance. He doesn't like doctors, whatever. He had been diagnosed in that interval with two esophageal tumors unresectable. Surgeons wouldn't go near it. The uh, doctor said, well, we'll give you chemo and radiation. And then he said, no, you're not. <laughs> so he takes his ivermectin. Maybe about six weeks later, I said, Eddie, you need to get a, a scan. I had to argue with Eddie to get a scan. We got the scan. No tumors. Gone. Gone. The problem was that he had sold his fishing boat. That was the biggest problem. He was getting better. His tumor was gone. Now he needed to go out and buy another fishing boat. That was the second patient. I was like, well, now that's interesting. 